always lucky here to have people that will step in and do what needs to be done when it needs to be done, you know. It could be chocolate cookies or it could be <laughs> different things like this, but when we need somebody to sing and lift us up, this is one gal that we always pick on. Shirley Bryson, please give us some. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here this morning amongst brothers and sisters in the Lord. And happy Mother's Day to all you ladies. I'm going to just sing an old, old traditional song that many of you know. You can sing along with me. It's the old song, If I Could Hear My Mother Pray Again. Amen. You know, I was so blessed to have a praying mama. Is that thing spitting? <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> she was truly a godly little woman, I tell you. She just married at 15, had six kids, and served the Lord, and taught us kids how to love the Lord. Uh, one of my most favorite stories is when we were children, and we had these old propane gas stoves, and she couldn't find a match anywhere. She just stood in that old country kitchen, and she said, Lord, I need a match. And she just put prayer, uh, legs to her prayers, and she was kept looking on. And she reached back in the back of the old pantry, and there in a cobweb was one match. That's all you needed, wasn't it? God answered prayer. She prayed about everything. And uh, I'm glad that we have praying mamas here today. Because I tell you, ladies, that's what's going to um, help us in all the years that are ahead of us and as we teach our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, that we, and that's a legacy we want to leave is that we are praying women. Thank you.
handsome glad morning she i know will welcome me to thy eternal home of peace and love sing it with me if i can hear my mother pray again if i could hear her tender voice as then so happy i would be twould mean so much to me if i could hear my mother pray again Well, we're going to be in Exodus. Let me turn this on. We're going to be in Exodus chapter number two, and um, we'll, we'll enter there. We'll give a little background before we get there in just a moment. But there's so many women in the Bible that we could uh, talk about. We're going to we've chosen three this morning to talk about because of their faith, women of faith in the Bible. And then what I want to do is draw the analogy or draw the the uh, uh, connection, I should say, to our mothers that we know, people that we know right here, right now, right in this place, in this building, and how the, you draw the, the conclusions here and see these same kinds of people of faith are today as they model the, the Word of God, as they know, as they have faith in the Lord. And we see that uh, living before us. So you not only have the biblical record of these who were great mothers and did marvelous things, but you also have uh, great uh, examples before us to see people, our own mothers that we remember and others as well that we know of in uh, this day and age in which we live. So let's uh, uh, first look in Exodus chapter 2. Starting at verse 1, we'll read down through verse 10. And it says, And a man of the house of Levi went and took a wife, a, 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 as a wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman uh, conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him and daubed it with asphalt and pitch put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion upon him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, and that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. And then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he, uh, he became her son. So that she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. Let us pray. Dear Father, we're grateful that, God, you spared Moses' life in a time when they were killing a baby's Lord. And, God, we see that even happening today where people have been spared miraculously, Lord, maybe a, a failed abortion, Lord, or whatever the case may be. But, God, we know that you spare people's lives. For the purpose, Lord, of your, your purpose, your plan. And Lord, such is the case in Moses as well. And Lord, we're thankful for Moses. Lord, he was far, far from being perfect a perfect child. But Lord, uh, you gave him a good mother and, and uh, she trusted in you to spare his life. That he may deliver his people Israel and we're thankful for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Then, of course, uh, we, we started in chapter 2 of Exodus, but you know the background is that Pharaoh was afraid that the Hebrews would, would become a great nation, and because uh, um, really they were, they were going to be a great nation. Uh, God, God had promised that, and Pharaoh didn't want to uh, uh, compete with a great nation, and so he sent out an edict saying every child, that, uh, uh, every male child, uh, when he uh, comes to being bo born, uh, that you take and, and kill that child at, at the moment of birth. And we find it interesting enough that Congress has, has uh, uh, talked about uh, doing this very same thing and day in which we live in, and it's absolutely uh, uh, unreal uh, to fathom the thought of killing a child uh, at the time that uh, they, they come and are born into this world, or even before they're born, to kill the child is, is absolute murder. And the Bible is against the word of God. God says, do not kill. Amen. And so uh, we understand that uh, uh, this is not the only time in history when this has taken place. And even the time uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ was born, uh, they were also in the process of trying to kill children at that time as well, but uh, two years old and younger. And that's why they, uh, uh, Mary and Joseph fled with Jesus into Egypt at the time. And so uh, there's, uh, there's occasions where uh, this has taken place in history in the past. So notice now, uh, as we talk about Moses' mother, her name was Jochebed. And we read that in chapter 6 as well. But uh, Jochebed, uh, and she was uh, uh, the mother of Moses who models the aspects of faith, of preservation. God expects our faith to move forward, to preserve life, and not only preserve life, but preserve the principles of life, the principles of God. And she was one uh, that was able to do that in the way that this uh, was all arranged. This was God's hand involved in every aspect of her making the little, the little ark uh, where he could uh, float in the river among the reeds and, and where he could be placed in a strategic place and the timing of it all, everything, I believe, was directed by God and she was following uh, the, the direction of God in a time that it was not easy to do so. And think about it, how that our mothers uh, uh, would come to a time in their lives to where it may, maybe was not an easy time. And I know even in my particular situation uh, that uh, I was kind of an accident, amen? And I, I found that out later on as a teenager. It kind of upset me to think about the fact that maybe I was an accident. And then later on, it became a real comfort to me because knowing that God makes no accidents, amen? And so it really became a great uh, uh, joy and a comfort to me thinking that uh, maybe I wasn't in the plan at the time, but I was in God's plan, and I, I rejoice and, and find great, uh, a great uh, consolation in that. And then we're going to talk then about Hannah, the mother of Samuel, who personifies the life of persistence in prayer. And then on to Ruth and her passion of faith. And so we've got a lot of ground to cover this morning. Uh, but uh, we have, it's a great subject to uh, talk about our, uh, mothers and uh, how that uh, uh, they are women of faith that have uh, uh, been there for us uh, and shown faithfulness throughout uh, uh, many situations of life. And so, uh, so much could be and should be said about motherhood more than any other human relationship. And overwhelmingly more, motherhood means being an instantly able to be interruptible, amen, or responsive and responsible. And Phil Weisenhut said, there's no greater place of ministry, position, or power than being a mother. And um, I, uh, to quote myself, I said that the, 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 the closest thing of, of being a, a preacher is of being a mother, amen? Uh, tell you that you, my mother preached some sermons to me, amen? 
with that uh, finger at my nose, and, and she, uh, she, uh, she would quote the Bible to me, and she said, be sure your sins will find you out, amen. And uh, so my mother uh, preached to me. Abraham Lincoln said this, he owed everything to his mother, which would be true of all of us, uh, so consider uh, this morning uh, these three women and then think about the fact that, that uh, how that God has blessed us with great mothers in our lives. And so notice, first of all, Jochebed, the mother of Moses. Her faith was the kind that sought out the preservation of her son Moses when Pharaoh was seeking to kill all the male babies. Ruth uh, uh, Graham said, as a mother, my job is to take care of the possible and to trust God with the impossible. And that is so true. To a certain degree, we all have to learn just doing that, doing what we can and trusting God with the rest. And that's uh, uh, what it means to be a parent, what it means to be a, a Christian, what it means to uh, live a life of faith is doing what we can and trusting God for the outcome. Notice then, first of all, consider all the effort it took to hide baby Moses those first three months before she hid him in the ark in the, in the Nile River. But the, the, just, just to hide him, knowing that the sentence of death could come at any moment, uh, because he would uh, maybe be crying, he would be hungry, he would need a diaper change and uh, need some attention. Maybe he was sick in his stomach and w had some colic or something like that. And so uh, she had to quiet and baby Moses. And, and so it took a lot of effort and a lot of faith and a lot of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of trying to keep the child quiet. Next, consider uh, that God, in answer to her prayer, no doubt she prayed a lot about this, revealed to her how to form the little ark and making it. And she says she formed it and, and pitched it with the asphalt and pitch and, and made it waterproof. Now, I'm pretty sure that she didn't just say, okay, uh, I'm going to just kind of slap this on and, and then uh, uh, stick the baby in. I'm sure she tested it out. I'm sure she made sure that it could hold the weight of, of the of baby Moses. And I'm sure that she tested it and uh, tried to make sure uh, that this was going to work. She probably also went down to the river a few times and looked and said, Now, the, the, the Pharaoh's daughter comes over down this way out to uh, b um, bathe at a certain time of the day. And so uh, this, I'm going to place, strategically place uh, little baby Moses in this ark uh, right down here at this place. And no doubt she'll be able to see it. She'll be able to hear him. And, and uh, 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 she'll be able to, uh, uh, and she had to trust God that he, she would spare his life. Because the edict was to kill all the, the male babies. But uh, my goodness, she knew that, that uh, the heart would be touched with, uh, with uh, uh, the baby Moses. And so notice then how that uh, we know the plans that God had for Moses to be the future deliverer of Israel. But on her side of the situation, she didn't have those promises. She didn't know what God was doing, but she knew it was necessary to preserve his life. So she was doing what a mother naturally does. Then maybe without completely realizing, but yet trusting God, was working on the other side of the equation. And that's what we have to trust God as parents. Uh, we do the best we can on our side of the equation of parenting, but we also have to trust that God is doing uh, in their lives or what uh, in their hearts, in their minds, in their cir circumstances of uh, what uh, is uh, right uh, for his will to be done. And so we cannot minimize the importance of Moses' sister as well. She was on the lookout. And she had to approach Pharaoh's daughter in such a manner uh, that she could be able uh, to talk her and say, well, now listen, I know a, a Hebrew woman that could take care of, her, of, ba of the baby. And, and, and she had to approach her in a certain way, in a certain time. And, and so uh, that was very important. 
But I want you to note one other fact before we move on, and that is this. Think of the fact that our faith would, uh, will influence the lives of generations to come. How that this was not only for this particular time, but how that this would influence generations uh, to yet to come. And how that uh, Moses then would be uh, uh, the, the writer of the first five books of the Bible. Think about that. We have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses wrote those books. And that was a, the foundation for all of the else of the word of God. That was the foundation for the law. That was the foundation for uh, 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 God blessing Israel. In fact, get this. Every single principle that you find in the Bible has its beginnings in the book of Genesis. You find, you go back to the book of Genesis and you find uh, that all these different things that Moses wrote about, he, there was a beginning there, a beginning point. And here's the great thing about the word of God. And that is, we know that it was not just written by man. It was God directing men as they wrote the word of God because whenever you find that seed that thought, that particular principle, that particular teaching, and it starts in the book of Genesis, and then you follow it through, it's consistent all the way through. And so uh, this all started with Moses, amen? And it started actually with the mother of Moses, Jochebed, being willing uh, to uh, uh, even put her own life on the line uh, to spare the life of Moses. Then we move on quickly to Hannah, the mother of Samuel, and we find this story in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and we're going to pick it up at verse 9. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, and now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall come upon his head, meaning he would be a, a Nazarite with that vow. And it says in verse 12, And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. And now Hannah spoke in her heart, and only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. <laughs> so Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor nor intoxicating drink, but I poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not con uh, consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I've spoken unto the Lord to now. And then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you your petition which you've asked of him. Now it's interesting that he, he, he turned then, he saw that she was indeed very much sober and that she was indeed in sorrow and that she meant what she said. And so notice Hannah was childless in a culture when it was shameful to not be able to bear children. And we picked up the story kind of early in verse 9, but the previous verses tell us that her husband had another wife as well. Now, that's uh, the, you could uh, say, well, this is quite a controversy. Well, maybe so. There were uh, several people in, in the Bible times that had more than one wife. I don't understand that. I don't think it was God's original plan. In fact, this is evidence that it wasn't God's original plan because the wives were in competition with one another. The other wife, I forget what her name was, but uh, you find that in the first few verses of 1 Samuel, and uh, she was picking on Hannah. She said, I'm the one that's uh, got children, and you don't have any children. 
And so uh, she, she would uh, uh, make fun of Hannah. And then uh, not only was Hannah being made fun of by the other wife, she was also being uh, mocked by the priest because he misunderstood her at first. And he said, uh, uh, put your wine away from you. you you're just coming to God's house drunk. And, and, uh, it's, uh, and then after she told him what was going on, notice her vow was that she would give the child to the Lord for his service. Now, many people will say things in a time of emergency or a time of sorrow, a time of, of grief uh, that uh, they really don't mean. But she meant what she said, and she, uh, when she uh, vowed that she would give the child to the Lord, she indeed did so. At the time when he was weaned, then she gave him Samuel uh, to the priest. And notice, Hannah understood the principle of giving all to the Lord, even our children. And if we withhold something or someone, we have blocked many times a blessing. Now, this is a principle that I trust that as, as Christian people, we all need to get, not just for preachers and missionaries and, and deacons and such, but we need to all get to the place to where we give our all to the Lord and we say, Lord, whatever you want in my life, I'm willing. Whatever you want to do, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do, and we'll see that here in just a little while with Ruth. But uh, I think we all need to get to this point. Now, Warren Wiersbe, who passed away last week, I, uh, a great, great writer of commentaries in the Word of God, he passed away, and I, I was reading some quotes by him, some books by him this last week. The mind, it's what he says, the mind grows by taking in, but he says the heart grows by giving out. And isn't that so true of our mothers? The mind grows, but uh, as we take in knowledge and, and certain things, but, but the heart grows as we give out. Notice then, she had a great faith in God because she was releasing her son into a situation because Eli was not the best parent. He was not the greatest role model, and yet she gave him over to the Lord, and she upheld her, her, her bow. Now, she could have said, well, you know, I, Lord, I, I promised that I would give him to you, but I don't think I like Eli. I don't like his situation. I don't like his sons. Uh, he doesn't make a mind. And, and uh, all this is documented in the Bible. And so uh, she could have reneged on her promise. But no, she said, I made the promise. I'm going to do what I vowed to do. And so she gave it all to the Lord. Notice then, thirdly, we come to Ruth, the mother of Obed, which just happened to be the uh, grandfather of King David, amen? So, uh, and she didn't know all this would take place. She was in a desperate way. Ruth chapter 1, verse 16, but Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, she's talking to her mother-in-law, or turn back from following after you, for whoever, wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts of you and me. So Ruth was a Gentile. And uh, uh, not just a Gentile, but she was a Moabite. Meaning that she would face an uphill battle being accepted by the Jewish people. But she determined that she would uh, go in faith with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and out of, I think, uh, out of uh, uh, allegiance to her, but basically out of allegiance to God, uh, she put her trust in the Lord, and her link to God was through her relationship with her mother-in-law of all things. Think about that. <laughs> Sometimes uh, the relationship that we have with our mother-in-law is not always good. Is it, you, know, is it, you know how it is. Uh, uh, I asked Brother Olin Bowles one time, I said, what about your mother-in-law? He says, well, she's a mother-in-law. 
<laughs> so, but, 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 you know, you, you just never know. And so uh, uh, here, here she had a relationship with her mother-in-law, but it, really her relationship was, was uh, uh, the mother-in-law showed her something about God. And that's why she made her, her vow and said, wherever you go, I'll go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God, she said. Notice it was a famine that drove them to come to Bethlehem, which is the house of bread. And God can direct our lives even in adverse circumstances. And I want to add, especially in adverse circumstances. God uh, takes uh, 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 Browning, uh, Pastor Browning Ware wrote it this way. He said, our worst circumstances may be God's best opportunity to bring new meaning into our lives. And so this was the case with Ruth. She came, she had lost her, her husband, which was Naomi's son. Uh, she had lost her husband. Uh, she had, uh, 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 they had lost many in their family. And then there was a famine in the land. And so it was a sorrowful, sorrowful time. And a time where they didn't have any food to eat, didn't know where to go, what to do. And the, the only thing they knew to do would be go back to Israel, to Bethlehem, to her uh, father-in-law's family, her mother-in-law's family, and go and to Bethlehem, the house of bread, and get not only physical bread, but get spiritual bread as well. Ruth got busy then when she got there gathering grain, which is hard work. Mothers do a lot of hard work. Amen. And Ruth got busy gathering grain. Luke, Ruth chapter 2, verse number 1. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a great man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him, whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. And she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come upon the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. So she followed then. We find the instructions of her, that her mother-in-law gave, and her passion was evident. She was a hard-working woman, and she went in the direction that was given unto her. So Boaz takes notice. He begins to ask some questions. Now, you, you, you kind of, eventually, it's obvious to everyone, uh, as you read it, not only do we know the end of the story, but to all, all those that were observing this. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of obvious sometimes when uh, people just kind of look at one another, you know? Uh, they knew that their eyes had met. They knew that they were beginning to observe one another, and the, these two are going to eventually be together. But there was, there was some uh, 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 um, hindrances that stand in the way. There was actually a nearer kinsman, but he could not uh, uh, redeem her. He could not pay the price and uh, take her under his wing. And so uh, Boaz then being the next kinsman, he became the kinsman redeemer. And so Ruth becomes the wife of Boaz, the mother of Obed, who was eventually the grandfather of David. In Ruth chapter 4, verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife, and when they went in, we went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who's not left you this day without a close relative, that his name may be famous in Israel. And so she married into the royal family, so to speak. Amen. <laughs> uh, she, she married into the family that would become uh, a David's family, the, the royal family for Israel. And, uh, uh, and she, she didn't have any designs on this. This was just following her heart, following the instructions of her mother-in-law. Out of all of this sorrow, out of all this hardship, uh, came these blessings to Ruth. And now uh, it, you turn over in your New Testament. 
in the book of Matthew and you read uh, the, uh, uh, the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ because he came through the lineage of David. And here you find Ruth being mentioned in the lineage, in the genealogy of, of David and eventually the Lord Jesus Christ as well. And so uh, she, she has a very prominent role. A very uh, a gracious part in, in playing. And faith played a part in each one of these mothers. Each one of their circumstances being different. And our circumstances are all different as well. Each one had challenges and also great opportunities. And faith enables us to be overcomers. Aren't you glad that God uh, does not uh, leave us just to ourselves? He doesn't just... Uh, 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 make us and put us here on this green earth, but he, he gives us the wherewithal. He gives us the instruction. He gives us the, the principles in his word. He gives us the ability to, to process these things and to carry out his will in our lives. That's what you call faith, faith in action. Hannah Smith said these words, keep your face turned upward to Christ as the flowers do the sun. You know, we built a little um, a cover over our back um, patio, and uh, it kind of shades the patio. We needed it desperately because the hot sun was very hot. And uh, we, plus, now if it rains, we can still sit out there and uh, listen to the rain. And the thunder, and as long as the wind's not too bad, uh, can be out there even in, in, in the bad weather. And But we have some beautiful flowers that we planted out there, and we have to keep turning those things because they always turn toward the sun. And you know what? That's what we ought to be doing as children of God, turning toward the sun and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're drawn to that. And that indeed is, is to be our, what our faith is to do, constantly uh, uh, growing, constantly uh, learning, constantly uh, uh, turning ourselves toward God in all ways, in all things. Let us stand together with our heads bowed. Our Father, we're grateful that, Lord, we can turn to you as these in the Bible did. And Lord, with great outcomes, each one of them. And Lord, our outcomes uh, uh, in our lives may not be as well noted. It may not be as famous. It may not be as, as a, 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 a part of a historical record. But Lord, no doubt, the things that we do, the things that we say, the faith that we have, Lord, no doubt will, will bear fruit throughout generations to come. And Lord, you do this through mothers of faith, and we're thankful for it in Christ's name. Amen. What number, brother? Number 446, take time to be holy. 446, as we take time to be holy, let God speak to your heart today while we sing. Time to be holy, speak off with the Lord. Abide in Him always, and feed on His Word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting it not. His blessing to see. Hey, aren't you glad that you can take time to be holy? And then the fruitfulness takes place after that. You can trust God as your personal Savior, and God comes into our lives. He changes us, and He changes us on the inside. A lot of people try to Work on the outside. It's a good thing to try to work on the outside, but the main thing is get the inside changed, and then the outside kind of takes care of itself. Amen.
You know, I, I, I got some, uh, uh, an email this last week that, you know, that there's always these uh, uh, places and organizations that try to say, okay, uh, uh, in, in your churches, you got, need to try to, to, to do fundraising and, and get people giving money. Oh, my goodness. Have they not read the scripture where you get your heart right with God? And after your heart's right, then seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added. Amen? And that's just a simple principle. And some of these same principles we find that's in the word of God, they, 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 they stay true. You follow through with that and it'll guide you the rest of your life. Some of those things my mother used to tell me, they, 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 they guided me all the way through and still to this day. That's what I tell the kids in vacation Bible school. Some of these same things that you learn in vacation Bible school, you'll carry with you the rest of your life. And, and they'll be part of, part of uh, what you make your decisions upon. Part of what you do in your life will be based upon these biblical principles that you've learned in the Word of God. Amen. What a blessing that is. Amen. Well, that's sermon number two this morning. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. Happy Mother's Day. Brother Jerry Barnes, could you dismiss us in prayer, please?